Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and the host for today's talk. Today's speakers are Teresa Poeta and Julia Starchi. Teresa is a postdoctoral researcher based at the University of Essex, working on the Liver Home Trust Project, grammatical variation in Swahili, contact, change, and identity. Teresa's research focuses on Bantu languages with a special interest in Swahili. For her PhD at SOAS at the University of London, Teresa worked on the morphosyntax discourse interface of Swahili and Mahuna. More broadly, she's interested in issues of language diversity and multilingualism. Julius is a senior lecturer at the Department of Foreign Languages and Linguistics at the University of Dar es Salaam, and he is a research associate at the Department of Linguistics and Language Practice at the University of the Free State. His areas of interest include morphosyntactic structures of Bantu languages, lexicography, and sign language linguistics. Currently, he is engaged in a collaborative research project entitled Variation in Swahili, Context Change and Identity, with scholars from the UK and Kenya. He is also engaged in a project entitled Linguistic and Social Cultural Aspects of Plant Names in Chiao, funded by the American Council of Learned Societies. Please join me in welcoming Teresa and Julius as they give their talk, Iswahili via Tanzania, Morphosyntactic Variation and its Perception in Four Areas of Tanzania. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Anne, and uh, hi, everyone. So, yeah, my name is Teresa, and together with Julius, we'll be presenting a little bit about uh, Swahili Morphosyntactic Variation, focusing on some data from Tanzanian locations. Uh, we are very excited to present here. And I think it's uh, almost exactly two years that Julius presented here with our colleague Hannah Gibson, who is the PI of our project. Um, and at the time, this project, which I'll talk about, was starting off. And uh, we are now uh, just sort of we've passed the two years um, mark on our project and we are halfway through. So we are very excited to be back here and uh, tell you where we have got to in those two years and things that are emerging. Um, and we are very keen to get some uh, feedback from, uh, from all of you. So let's get started. Um, okay, so just as a way of introduction, although I think many people will be familiar with this. Um, so um, there's variation in Swahili, and this has been noted for a while now. Although historically, a variation has been noted mostly for phonology, morphology, and the lexicon, while there has been less work on uh, morphosyntax. Um, also, this sort of variation that has been noted has been focused mostly on coastal varieties, the sort of more established Swahili dialects. Um, but in the last few decades, there has been an increased uh, sort of interest and in research on so mainland varieties. We have some references here, as well as uh, on micro variation in Swahili. Uh, but still, despite sort of the high number of speakers uh, of Swahili and this more recent interest, um, morphosyntax of Swahili remains quite underexamined. Um, and there's sort of no uh, up-to-date account of var variation found in Swahili. So this is sort of the background to uh, our project and our research. And just in terms of our talk today, um, I'll say a little bit about the project itself and uh, summarize some of our social linguistic findings. But then with Julius, we'll focus mostly on morphosyntactic data today and yeah, finish by summarizing um, the presentation. So in case you have not come across our project before and you um, were not present two years ago when Hannah and Julius were presenting, I'll tell you a little bit about the project. This, this presentation today is really um, part of this larger project. And also, although Julius and I are presenting, it's all uh, comes um, from a much bigger team. So um, as Anne said at the beginning, our project is called Grammatical Variation in Swahili, uh, Contact Change and Identity. And our aims are to um, research the sort of morphosyntactic variation in uh, present-day Swahili uh, to focus on how this variation is impacted by language contact. So very much focusing on the fact that Swahili is spoken in multilingual contexts. And then also to see how this variation is linked to um, speakers' identity. 
and the perception of this variation is linked to speaker's identity. Um, so on the slide here, you can see at the bottom a picture. This is of our team. So it's 10 of us. It's a collaboration between four universities, University of Essex, University of Dar es Salaam, Kenyatta University, Nairobi, and SOAS University. Um, so you can see this was at our meeting in Dar es Salaam where we all met in person. And on the right-hand side, you have a map. And circled are the locations where we have collected data so far. So the project um, focuses on Kenya and Tanzania. And so far, um, you can see we have three locations in Kenya, Kisumu, Nairobi, and Kilifi, and four in Tanzania. This is what we are focusing on today, Arusha, Dar es Salaam, Iringa, and Mtwara. Um, but this is sort of, uh, as we speak, this is being uh, expanded and some of our colleagues are in fact on data collection in Kenya uh, uh, right now. Uh, but this is where we are so far. And also just to give you a little bit of a background to how the data has come about that we are presenting today in terms of methodology. So we have a very sort of multi-method approach. Um, and some of the ways in which data has been collected is, uh, so we had an online perceptual survey um, that we circulated um, in the first year of our project. We do lots of social linguistic interviews and focus groups. Uh, we also employ linguistic ethnography and had lots of sort of field notes uh, from participants' observation and from our time in the different location. Um, also, lots of audio recordings of what we have sort of labeled natural data. That's just meaning sort of participants talking on different topics or in conversation with each other, uh, as well as more sort of traditional morphosyntactic elicitation. So we can say more about this with the specific set of data if people are interested as we go along. Uh, so this is a little bit about our project. Um, and also before we um, sort of present our data today, uh, we wanted to sort of talk about our, at the moment, working hypothesis of what our findings are sort of showing, what is emerging, so that you can keep it in mind as we present. And uh, this is very much work in progress. As I said, we are halfway through the project. So this is just where we are at right now, but we are very keen to uh, discuss this further and see how our data fits or doesn't fit into this. Uh, so our project data from these seven locations suggest a sort of a three or four way split in terms of uh, some uh, dialectal regions which are emerging. Uh, and this is, uh, you can see in different colors on the map, Kenya mainland, Tanzania mainland, and coastal dialects. So um, you have yeah, the coastal dialect sort of in blue across countries. And then sort of a fourth area, which however is uh, outside of the scope of our project, um, but which could be termed the Western Swahili dialect. So Swahili spoken in DRC, Uganda, Rwanda, et cetera. So this we have in purple on the map. And this is coming uh, through from both uh, social linguistic data, from our interviews on attitudes, language use and perception, as well as the morphosyntactic structural data, which we'll be mostly presenting today. Uh, but uh, having said this, um, despite this emerging regions, uh, the situation is definitely much more complex and there's both micro and macro variation beyond these emerging zones, which we'll illustrate um, shortly. Um, okay, so this is, sort of as introduction to the project, to our working hypothesis, um, and as background to our data. Um, in terms of social linguistic findings, we are not focusing on that so much today, but uh, we have a slide of sort of like a summary of some of the main themes that have come through. So I mentioned we did the perceptual survey online um, in the first year of our project. And uh, what has come through is, um, well, the definitely vast majority of participants um, thought that there were different ways of speaking Swahili. Uh, but both the survey and following interviews show that there is um, much variety in terms of attitudes towards this um, variation and towards the perception of this variation. Um, 
whenever both in the survey and in interviews, um, participants are asked about sort of naming, listing, or talking about specific varieties, um, coastal dialects are the ones that are mostly uh, mentioned, um, which is perhaps not surprising and maybe what we partly uh, expected. And in the perceptual survey also, uh, what has come sort of become apparent that respondents from the coast um, have a sort of stronger sense of their own named variety and distinguishing their variety from uh, surrounding ones and neighboring ones. For example, we had a whole set of participants from Pemba in our perceptual survey, and this was a very striking difference between their answers and answers of other participants. So overall, the coast versus mainland sort of split or differentiation um, is often mentioned. And this reflects what we have said at the beginning. It's really uh, reflecting the historical picture um, and this still um, enduring perception of the coastal dialects being the varieties of Swahili. The coastal um, Swahili is often referred to as original, pure, standard, or sometimes prestigious, as you will see in some of the quotes that we have here. Um, and another factor that was commonly mentioned was the difference between um, Kenya and Tanzania. So this came through both in the perceptual survey and uh, consistently comes through also in our um, social linguistic interviews. But aside from maybe these, uh, let's say, patterns that we expected, so coast, mainland, Kenya, Tanzania, um, both in interviews and in the survey, participants often also refer to different domains of use. So how Swahili is spoken at home is different from in education. People often refer to sort of street Swahili, um, but also other factors such as um, vocation. So quite often people refer to, uh, you know, Dala Dala conductors having their own way of speaking Swahili or other sort of vocation jobs having their own um, way of speaking. Uh, age is referred to as well, religion as well. So really quite a variety of factors that people perceive as um, influencing um, uh, variation in Swahili. Uh, and something that's also comes through quite strongly is participant mentioning speaker's first language as something that determines how they speak Swahili. So even in listing varieties of Swahili, um, participants might uh, refer to things such as like Bantu Swahili, so like Swahili spoken by the speakers of other Bantu languages, Kiswahili Hindi, or Chaga Swahili, as we'll see, I think, in the quote on the next slide. So very much, again, here we see that even in our social linguistic findings, the multilingualism of the places where Swahili is spoken is very relevant um, in a speaker's perception as well. So I think we have just a couple of quotes um, sort of to illustrate this that come from our interviews. So here from um, uh, a speaker in Moshi, uh, so Chaga by Swahili is regarded as Chaga. Swahili spoken in Tanga is the original one, or in the Swahili. Kiswahili cha Tanga nikile original. Ukienda Dar Salam, ndio kabisa original namba moja. Kwa hivyo sisi chakwetu kina tofauti. So this perception of the Swahili of the coast being the original one, the sort of pure nam namba moja one, while the Swahili is um, spoken in Moshi being perceived as different. Um, and another participant from Moshi, Kunawatu uh, wakitoka huku wakienda dar, unakuta kama kiswahili kimebadilika, kimekuwa tofauti, kile chahapa hatumi tena. So some people change their Swahili once they travel to dar, and when they come back, their Swahili uh, sounds different, and they don't use the sort of local Swahili anymore. So this also association with the coast and sort of um, using the coastal variety as a sort of marker of either prestige or association with the coast is a very common theme that comes through. Um, 
And then we have one last quote, which um, sort of to show a little bit sort of of a different side. And this is from Mtuara. So would we very much consider a coastal location in our project? Um, but in this in this instance, we have a quote from um, a participant who says, since we understand each other, I don't say our Swahili is different or the Sukuma Swahili have a pure Swahili or we people from Tuara speak Swahili. No, uh, any variety of Swahili is good. Um, so in this sense, perhaps surprising, uh, sort of less of a perceived hierarchy. Um, and maybe what we are starting to discuss is maybe uh, some differences between even within the coast. So we had the speakers from Penba and the perceptual survey having a very strong sense of their varieties being distinct and different. And while maybe sort of the southern coast, or maybe there are also other factors in play in Tuara, this uh, doesn't seem to be such a strong pattern. And yeah, this quote nicely illustrates a perhaps opposite sort of seeing a, a less hierarchical view on Swahili varieties. Uh, so this was just a little taste of the social linguistic findings, and uh, we're happy to come back to those if you want to know more during the questions. Uh, but now we really want to turn to um, some morphosyntactic data to present. Um, so um, for our morphosyntactic data, um, as I said, we collect data in many different ways. But we work with a list of about 76 features, um, which we try sort of and research and ask about and notice. And this is a mixture of features that either variation for them had already been attested in Swahili, or maybe there is variation in other Bantu languages, cross Bantu, that we want to see if it shows up in Swahili as well through language contact. Um, obviously, today we have a quite short space, so we can't uh, speak about all the features. And for many, we also haven't gathered data that much data yet. But we wanted to pick a few features to illustrate some of the ones that um, sort of show our working hypothesis about dialectal regions and some other which show that the picture is more complex than that. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about habitual marking and the use of the aga suffix. Um, and then Julius will talk about um, evaluative uh, morphology, diminutives, augmentatives, and also present some more um, Tuara specific features. This is the use of ka in relative clauses and the use of double pronouns, which come from quite like recent data collection. So uh, fresh of the press sort of data that we are still working through. Okay, let me just check how we're doing with time. I think I'm okay. Hopefully I don't take too much time away from Julie's. Um, okay, so habitual marking. So again, many of you will be familiar with this. And if you heard Julius and Hannah talk two years ago, then probably you will remember that this was one of the features that we started off with. Um, and that's because we know that there is variation in Swahili about uh, on um, marking of habitual. So standard Swahili, based largely, as we know, on Zanzibari Swahili, uses the marker who to encode uh, habitual meaning. However, there is also a suffix ag, or aga, which is both present in many other Bantu languages and has also been reconstructed for Proto-Bantu. Uh, and we uh, know already from also, for example, Ruge Malira's work and other have noted that this ag suffix um, is attested in colloquial Swahili. So in one, we have Ruge Malira's example, unakulaka wapi, and also Ruge Malira's quote saying, standard Swahili may be reclaiming productive inf inflection ag, and its wide occurrence um, in colloquial Swahili seems to be unstoppable. So we were intrigued about this unstoppable phenomena and wanted to know more. So we have, uh, in fact, gathered quite a lot of data on this subject in these past two years. And uh, what we found is that there is, indeed, this variation is widely attested, 
but there's also quite a bit more complex. It's not just a variation between who and ag, but there's more variation both in terms of forms and in terms of function. So on this map, you have a sort of slightly simplified uh, picture of what we found um, to illustrate um, uh, the distribution. And the first thing to note is that straight away when we started looking into this, we realized that aga also um, appears as anga, so two versions of the suffix. And you'll see on this map that within the project, we really found quite a clear split between aga used in Tanzania and ang with the n used in Kenya. So this is where our also dialectal regions are starting to emerge. Um, and you will see also on the map that um, this seems to be much more there in our mainland location, but where it comes to the coast, we found Ag only in Dar es Salaam. And this is perhaps to be expected uh, because even though Dar es Salaam is of course also a coastal location, it's also a major urban center with lots of speakers of different languages, lots of language contact. So really a bit of a microcosm of um, languages almost on its own. Um, but as you will see from examples, so this is a little bit on the distribution side, but we also found that uh, these markers can combine. So we can find who and ag on the same verb. We found who in the form of hua um, with ag as well. So even just this distribution is doesn't quite show the whole picture. And also we found that there are different ways in which people express habituals such as verb reduplication or some lexical items such as sana sana. We had that a lot. We have that uh, on the Kenyan side. Um, so there's a lot, much more to it than just the distribution of who and uh, ag. But so now to focus a little bit on our Tanzanian data, uh, so as I said, in Dar es Salaam is where we get quite a lot of different forms, and this is to be expected with the um, diversity of the sort of Swahili uh, speakers community there. So in two, we have Huwa Napenda Kuangalia Televisheni, I love watching TV. And here we have this very common use when who is used. We found that rather than directly on the verb, it's more often used with the verb to be as a sort of auxiliary uh, construction. In three, this is an example of our aga now. Una tumiaga hiki kinyaji. Do you use this drink? And in four, this is what I was mentioning it, the different combinations. So this is one way in which these markers combine. Huwaga sipendi ujinga. Usually I don't like foolishness. So here we can see that both um, we found who and ag combined, as well as used with the verb to be in this sort of like auxiliary kind of uh, construction. Uh, if we now move to Moshi, so in Moshi, we really found a widespread use of ag um, and quite common. Um, I think these both uh, examples are from our social linguistic interviews. In five, ndo inavio kuaga, it is like that. And in six, Tuli Osamaga, uh, Kiswahili Huku Zamani, those of us who studied Swahili in the past. Um, I think this was one of the more common ways of um, uh, marking habitual in Moshi. Um, and I, in fact, don't think we got any examples of who or who are there. So it was sometimes unmarked, but mostly marked with ag. Um, and now we move to Iringa. So here also, um, ag was used by most speakers. Um, I would say this was the preferred way to mark habitual, although we did find some others. And we'll see further that, um, in fact, ag was used for much sort of beyond even just the habitual marking. But in seven, we have an example of uh, ag for habitual. Mbona leo unachuma mapema, wakati unachumaga jioni. How come you're harvesting early today? Normally you harvest in the evening. So this is a very sort of um, clearly habitual marking example. And in eight, we see an example with the negative. This is also very common in Iringa. 
Silalagi Mchana. I don't usually sleep in the afternoon. And we'll come back to this sort of uh, use of art in negative habitual, as we also think that that might be one of the motivation for the rise of this of aga uh, because the marking um, who when you mark habitual with who there is no designated negative habitual you have to just use a present tense negative so the fact that ag the aga becomes agi means there is sort of a distinct negative habitual um, so we think this is one one of the perhaps motivations behind its wide use um, and here we come to Mtuara. So this is where sort of we found a different uh, situation because in Mtuara, in fact, we didn't find either Ag or Hu or Huwa. And um, participants strongly sort of preferred um, to, didn't have a distinct like habitual marking, but used just the unmarked present tense. So in nine, we have Binti Sila Anam Mutema. Mrs. Sila always wakes up early. And in 10, we have another example of like unmarked or present tense for habitual. Um, and I quite like this example because here what I've put, so in this for interviewer and P is for participant. So here I just wanted to show you that despite the fact that the interviewer uses both who and ag in the question, when the participant sort of answers and sort of repeats the same construction, still really reverts to like not marking it and using the present tense. So I think this might have even been you, Julius, I think, speaking and interviewing. Um, uh, Quahibio, this was a social linguistic interview about listening to songs and radio in different languages. So I think Julius or someone else from the team says, Quahibio we muda wingine huwa unaskis. Kilizaga, hizi za kimakonde, and the participant sort of agrees and says, eh, kimakonde tunaskiliza. So, huwa unaskilizaga, so both marking of habitual, but yet the participant really, when sort of almost repeating the construction, gets rid of all the habitual marking and just uses the present tense. So, I think this illustrates quite well the situation in Tuara. Having said that, there's always a sort of but or a, a sort of um, complication, not quite a complication, but we did in our data find one example of aga in Mutuara, and you have that in example 11. This again is from a social linguistic interview, and here the participant says, Mi mwenyewe si juagi kama kiswahili ni nacho ongea ni chakawaida. I never realized that I speak ordinary Swahili. And here you can see Sijuagi, the Aga form. Um, again, this is perhaps interesting that it happens to be a negative form that maybe speaks to this um, sort of appeal of the Ag suffix that it can you can express a negative habitual, which you wouldn't be able to do if you were just using present tense or who form. And lastly, this we won't go into much detail right now, but we still thought it was an interesting feature, so we wanted to mention that in Tuara, we found what seems to be a marker specifically for past habitual. So Zamani wa kiita kangala. In the past, they used to call it kangala. And we have a number of examples of this, and maybe Julius can say more if people are interested. Um, but so this interesting situation where habitual marking in the present doesn't seem to be morphologically marked, but we found a past habitual marker. Okay, I think I'm almost done so that Julius has enough time to go through uh, the other features. But on the next two slides, we just wanted to show that apart from this quite complex variation in habitual marking, there's sort of also... Um, more variation in terms of how this suffix aga is used. And we have data both from Iringa and Dar showing examples where ag is used, but it really doesn't seem to be connected to a habitual meaning. So in Iringa specifically, the use of ag with subjunctives is very common. 
Um, and I often mention this phrase, tuendage, tuendage, which was often sort of heard in Iringa and people perceive it as very like Iringa Swahili. So here we have a different example, e niongeage, should I start speaking or should I speak? Um, we also found ag both with past and future tense, this is in 14 and 15. And again, this does not seem to be the case that this is past habitual or future habitual. So we have a sentence, Nilindaga Zanzibar Mwakafulani, I once visited Zanzibar. And in the future, even very specific, Kesho Uta Ondokaga. So there, it really doesn't seem to be the habitual function, even though we have glossed it habitual for now. And here, just the very similar, also found in Dar, Nilindaga Kwangu, I should go home. And Ali Shakufaga Sikunyengi, he died long ago. Again, this with the verb kufa, I think it really sort of exam is a good example of where the habitual uh, habitual uh, interpretation is not really um, an option. So I think I'll stop here and hand over to Julius, uh, who will talk about the rest of the features. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Um, so I will take over from where Teresa has just stopped and I will talk about evaluative morphology. Um, so we found some interesting variations in terms of the expression of diminution and augmentation. And part of this is related to the noun class assignment and an argument. And we know that these are just quite widespread across uh, Bantu languages. And so the corresponding variation uh, in the evaluative morphology is quite you know, evident in the dialects of Swahili. And these variations often reflect the wider pattern of morphological change that we find in these languages. And we also found that some of these de developments are often local in the sense that they are found in some varieties in some re regions, while in, in other regions uh, they are totally absent. So generally, variation in noun class morphology does not so much reflect the broad dialect areas. So maybe between mainland Kenya and Tanzania and, and the coasts, but they reflect a diverse pattern of micro and, and macro variations. So we have a, a table of noun class here in the next slide. Um, which uh, summarizes sort of the noun classes that we found in the dialects that we studied. But uh, our interest is on the class, in, on class uh, 11, 12, and 13, which are used to express diminution and, and augmentation. Um, uh, yeah, before, before you move that. So we found that uh, in most of the, the, the dialects, uh, the, the diminution through class 12 is uh, quite uh, robust, with the exception of, of Mtuala, where we find this is quite uh, you know, absent, and we shall, shall see it in the examples that we are in the next slides. Yes. Uh, yeah, so we, as we probably know, that uh, diminution in Swahili is uh, mostly expressed using the class seven, uh, key and the corresponding class H V, and this is quite uh, you know, common in standard Swahili, as in kim tiki dogo, uh, small chair. And but there is also use of class twelve and thirteen, uh, which has been attested in, in colloquial Swahili, and we also encountered this in Swahili and our our Dar Islam data as well as in 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 Moshi and Iringa. Uh, in 19, you see Kadyuku Kadogo Bado Kana means in Minan. This was reported by one respondent whom I asked, How many do you have any, you know, you, any grandchildren? And then said, Kadyuku, I mean, just a small, I mean, still young, young grand, grandchild. And when it comes to Mtuara, uh, the expression of diminution is not morphologically, you know, uh, encoded. They just use bare, um, bare, bare words without any morphological, you know, any, 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 
an attachment of a morphine to indicate that it is a diminuity. So when we ask them whether to express if you have a shamba or a farm, which is smaller than the usual size, they just say like shamba dogo. Whereas in maybe Moshi and Iringa would expect like kashamba kadogo or kashamba kidogo. So kashamba kadogo where was frowned at, the, the participants say, no, we don't say like kashamba kadogo, so we simply say shamba dogo. And in the next slide, we also find the augment, augmentation because diminution and augmentation are also all, all part of the evaluative morphology. And in standard Swahili, we know that it is used, um, it is expressed by using G in some versions, like G2, a uh, big person. And we also attested, it was also, this was also attested in, in, in Moshi uh, during the, um, the interviews and elicitations. And also the Li, uh, the classifier of um, morphine, uh, um, um, the classifier of prefix is in Lijumba Likubo, to mean that it's a big house. Um, but we found some more interesting variations uh, in terms of form uh, across different locations that we visited. And one interesting uh, feature was that of using a class three um, prefix plus a lexical expression that would encode um, hugeness or largeness in terms of size. Um, Anabongi Lamgari, who this, you know, we encountered this in Dar es Salaam. Uh, I mean that he has this huge, a uh, very huge uh, car. So the word bonge is now uh, used independently to encode um, this um, augmentation, but together with the class three prefix mm, But because originally it should be just gari, not in gari. But there are also cases where there is no morphological marking at all. And alternatively, the, there is the use of intensifiers like sana or very. So in, this is what we see in 25, shamba kubwa sana. That is enough for, I mean, in 12, they don't add anything more than that. And in Iringa, the uh, augmentation, um, augment, augment, augmentative is very widespread and very robust. And we found a, a very interesting Prefix gu, which is usually used to express uh, largeness. Gunyumba bukubwa, a big house, and this is from class 20, which is not very common in some other areas. And we are uh, um, convinced that this maybe is a, a result of language contact, uh, contact with the neighboring Bantu languages, especially Bena, where we have a class 20 uh, prefix. Prefix gu, which indicates uh, augmentation, as in gunembwe, which means a big or huge elephant, as reported by Morrison. So, um, apart from these features that we try to compare from different areas, and we also encountered some features that are region specific that we found in region A or area A, but could not be found in region B. So we are trying to see now from, we we'll have a look at this from Twara and some other locations. And one interesting feature was that to do with pronoun doubling that we encountered in Twara, and where a pronoun is used uh, before and after the head noun. And, and this is to do with both personal pronouns as well as demonstrative pronouns. As in 29, we which means uh, to mean you man, or literally you man. So we have it at the beginning and then at the end. But a lot of instances were to do with uh, demonstrative pronouns, where we have the pre-nominal and um, and and post-nominal occurrence of the of the of the demonstrative pronouns. In this case, we also we are also convinced. That as it is it's probably uh, an influence from some neighboring languages spoken in, in southern Tanzania, especially Mwera, uh, Makonde, and Iyawa, where which have also reported uh, these instances of pronoun doubling as uh, this is from Makonde reported by Makanjila, 
And then in Ichiyao, um, this is in my forthcoming chapter in a book on morphosyntax, which means this rat. So we have the demonstrative at the beginning and then at the end. And in Tuara, we also find something which is very unique and we have not find, found it yet in other areas. Uh, maybe we can, as you, our research is still ongoing, maybe you can find something to support this from other areas. The use of a car, which uh, uh, it looks like um, the, the, a marker that is used to introduce uh, some relative clauses. Like, kwa hivo, huyu mke aliekamuwa huyu, which means the, therefore this wife whom he married. Pale alipo kajenga, huyu binti na pajua. I know the place where this lady built. Because in standard society, this would be like, kwa, kwa hiyo, huyu mke aliemuwa. And the 34 would be like, Pale alipojenga, that would be enough. But we see the insertion of car before the relative clause. And so we don't know at, at the moment the exact, exact function of, the, uh, of this suffix, but we are yet to determine it as, uh, as we uh, continue with our, our research in other areas. Now here uh, we is a summary now of what we found in relation to morphosyntax the variations in the three regions that we, we visited. So certain features examined here seem to support the coastal mainland split that we find that some of the features are um, widespread along the coast while others are widespread along the, I mean, along the, along the mainland. So for instance, habitual marking um, and diminutive marking, we saw diminutive marking is most common along the coast, I mean, in the in the mainland, um, but uh, we found also cases of this along the coast, especially Dar es Salaam, but due to the influence from us so from the mainland, because Dar es Salaam is a cosmopolitan area. And other features reveal a more localized picture, often reflecting some language contact situations, like what we have seen in Mtwa. So we find the car and the I mean lots of ag, which are quite unique to Mtwa. And the augmentative, like the such as the one using the ku, which is unique to Iringa, we didn't find it in Moshi and in other areas. And doubling of the pronouns, these are also region specific as well as ka in relative causes. So generally, morphosyntactic features that we have examined here often show a complex picture of micro and micro macro variations with a range in form as well as, well as in the function of these uh, features that we have found. And so to conclude, um, what we have just seen in our project so far, there is a high degree of morphosyntactic morphosyntact variation attested in Swahili. So it is not spoken in the same way. We find it in a certain feature in area A, but absent in area B. But there are also emerging findings which suggest that, you know, four dialect, area, dialect areas, and this is supported by both social linguistic and, stu and structural data. So as we have seen, there is social linguistic information or data, and there is also morphosyntactic and structural data, which clearly support the differences between these different areas. And data from Tanzania, Tanzania locations, so coastal mainland distinction in social linguistic findings, and they also reflect a, a historical picture as well as enduring perception of dialects how people perceive their dialects and dialects of other people. Um, but morphosyntactic data also show a degree of macro variation as well as more localized innovations often related to language contact. This we have also, I've already mentioned in the previous, previous slide. And so generally, multilingual language ecologies and language contact central, uh, is central to the understanding of variation in Swahili, both in Tanzania uh, and beyond. So thank you very much for your participation, for listening to us. And you can see this van here that we used in Kenya to travel to uh, Meru. Asante. Thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. So we can now start the question and answer section. And I saw that Helen Eaton was the first one to raise her hand. So I'll give her the turn. Very much. 
Yeah, that was really interesting. Thank you. Um, something that caught my eye was the ad in the Oringa area. So I'm in Mbeya and work with a lot of people from that area, including some Wanji who use an al in their language for subjunctives in a way that they've never been able to fully explain to me, but they often talk about it as a way of softening a command and uh, making it more of a suggestion it's a friendly thing to do so if you're suggesting let's go it's not we really should go but you know let's go so I wonder if it's it's being used in Swahili in a similar way yeah thank you very much for that and in fact we have a sort of one of the things that we are looking at is like soften imperatives because this um, um, someone has sort of have talked to us about this in uh, another language, um, which wasn't really in the Iringa area, but just as a sort of uh, as something that happens, the act with subjunctives is sort of soften. Uh, I don't know that in our data is um, so like clearly distinguishable that this could be the function, but it is very, very common. I would say that in Iringa, like the ag with subjunctive was one a very like distinctive feature. Um, and yes, and like Tuendaga, it was the first thing I heard when I got off the bus. So um, it's an interesting, definitely useful to know about Mwanji and something that would be interesting for us to look into. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's one of the things that has been suggested to us and that we are also considering. Um, it seems to be like a little bit wider than that. And also I think in Bena as well, this like, the ag with the subjunctive um, is is there in a sort of like hortative or iterative meaning. Like we had this example, like, should I start speaking? Um, so that's also another link that we are sort of exploring the link with this particular construction in Bena. But yeah, thank yeah. you. Very interesting. I've noted it down and definitely. Okay. Um, one yeah, it's it's a feature that I've experienced in several languages. The Wanji are the people who told me that uh, for them, their best way of describing it is this politeness. But yeah, it's in a lot of very languages around the Mbeya region as well, and the Swahili here as well, definitely. But I've never been completely convinced it's exactly the same, say, in Bena versus Wanji. So I'm not surprised if it's it seems complex in Swahili. Yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, what a great project. Let me just say, I think that this is a fantastic project, long overdue. <laughs> and uh, in the field of language contact, it's such a great like experiment because you have Kiswahili in contact with so many different languages. There's so many different variables and uh, trying to get at that. Why is it certain choices are made? Uh, you know, it, it's just a great kind of example of, you know, micro typology, if you will, but just really important for the field of language contact. Uh, so my, my comment is when I first heard the AGA, I thought, I love this. This is so great. It's so much easier to understand than the who. And I'm trying to think about why that is. When I hear, when I would hear the who, I, I'm expecting a subject in that position, right? So I'm, I'm choosing, is that a who you? Are they about to say who you or are they saying ooh and maybe I misheard and it's who instead of ooh. But when it's aga, it's just so much easier to perceive. Now, of course, a, a negative C in that is also in subject position, but C is not acoustically as weak as a who syllable is to me. So I'm just saying that I, I liked your argument that you know the, that you could negate the habitual and that might be a reason why you prefer the aga, but I'm just saying just uh, coming at it as you know <laughs> a second language learner i just love the aga it's just so um distinct and clear and i've never heard the anga before that's that's interesting but i haven't spent much time in kenya <laughs> so thanks again for your talk and your work and i, I think it's going to be going you're going to have a lot of great interesting results thank you yeah thanks and yeah maybe i can just add to that just in terms of like the like function sort of motivation that perhaps could be one of the things contributing to the spread of aga or the wide use of aga i think in um, yeah we didn't have it sort of today we didn't have enough space but in our sort of like um, list of motivations that might be contributing to the use of aga yeah the functional one is the negative but also 
also the subject marking, as also you were mentioning. So that's quite a sort of who is in a very non-canonical uh, position for a tense aspect marker in Swahili. And yeah, it doesn't have subject marking or doesn't mark the subject, which is unusual. So uh, the negative, the fact that you can put aga into negation and that you can have subject marking with aga is part of the argument of the functional argument we might be contributing. Uh, but then, of course, the language contact, the fact that it's just so widespread in so many other Bantu languages and that so many speakers of Swahili will have another Bantu language in their repertoire, which uses aga for habitual, is, I think, another sort of, or we think, another strong motivation. Um, and then maybe just to add that we are also, because we try and think of the link to social linguistics and identity, also, people have noted before us that this ag or aga is quite like a um, marker of mainland identity. And that can be sometimes both maybe perceived in like a negative way or sort of a bit dismissive maybe from people on the coast. But it's also in a way like a distinct identity from maybe the more standard coastal one. Um, and uh, I think in Tanzania, uh, Julius, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure whether we have come across much commentary, social linguistic commentary on ag in terms of uh, like why people might use it. But in Kenya, I know that on the coast in Kilifi, we had sort of people generally speaking, oh, no, anga, that's not on the coast, that's on the mainland, and we don't speak like that. And the sort of, I think you get a bit of that in Tanzania as well. But then we had also people saying, well, some young people who travel and live in Nairobi and then they come back to the coast, they might want to use it because by using the ag, or in that case, ang, they're showing their sort of, they have been to the big city, they have sort of lived, like traveled experience. So in a way, sort of having some sort of like positive, like marking uh, cool or positive experience. And uh, I think this has been also noted for aga in Tanzania sometimes as well, it's sort of younger maybe like urban sort of context um so yeah lots of different yeah. reasons but yeah i agree as a learner of swahili i agree with the point that it makes lives much easier in many ways and it's easier to hear and it's easier to use so uh, i agree with that Aaron? Uh, uh thank you Teresa and and julius for a nice presentation uh it's always interesting with variation in Swahili. Um, and uh, I have two small questions, um, I think for Adi, or for the part that you presented at least. Um, first, Anabonge um, Langari, uh, this construction, uh, which I didn't know about, I uh, find it very interesting. And I was curious about, so you said it's, consistently class three with different nouns. And uh, does it work in the plural with class four or a different, uh, if, you, if you have any data on this? Um, and then just briefly on the, on the pronoun doubling, uh, which I also found very interesting. And I'm currently working on language in Mozambique and I noticed just the other day that they have a similar thing where they use a lot of uh, demonstratives or, or pronouns. Uh, so I was curious if you have any analysis of what the function might be uh, mm -hmm. of this construction. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's, yeah, it's very interesting. Yes, um, we saw that the Bongelamgari, as I say, it means a, a huge car. And bonge is an independent word, which maybe you could call it an adjective or whatever, which could attach, could be used even with some other nouns. Uh, bongela nyumba, to mean a huge house. Bongela, bongela, bongela shamba, to mean a huge farm. And in this case, it was it was used with Mgari, which is a uh, I mean now class three derived from uh, from Gari, which is class nine, and 
And, and I think this derivation from Gari to Mugari is also supported by the, 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 the adjective Bonge, because now Bonge means more than, I mean, more than usual size. And then you have to also attach the, this uh, augmentative prefix, which is now M. Mm. So we're also yet to determine, I mean, what exactly. I think maybe we lost Julius. Temporarily connection. Hopefully, it uh, will sort out. I think. Um. Uh. I think maybe just to say, yeah. I like also Andrew. Thank you for the explanation of uh, Bonge and, and translation. And I think we have found uh, this expression actually quite often in Moshi. Uh, this like use of Bonge la also actually in Kenya in Nairobi. I think I've also seen it in adverts. I think a supermarket has it now. I've forgotten a little bit, but last time I was there, there was something with it. Um, but just maybe a comment on the class three, because I think you were also asking about that, Aaron, whether we can find also class four. So I think we did find also the plural. I think actually with uh, Migari, and there was another one, and maybe Julius will remember. But I have to say that this class three, four, in an augmentative uh, meaning, uh, like we haven't found it very often. And I think two or three times it was specifically with Gari. So I don't know if it's something about, um, yeah, the, the car noun, but it's it just happened that like the two or three examples were actually with the same noun. We did definitely, it wasn't the only one. I think maybe, I wonder if we got also something like Mjumba for like a big house, um, but I I don't know now for sure, but it is for now quite limited. So it's not something that we have found a lot, uh, but yeah, we have found the plural as well. And on the pronoun doubling, I'm afraid I'm, I will wait and see if Julius comes back because it's really quite new data that Julius um, collected um, a couple of months ago. So we are just working through it. So I also right. think it's quite exciting and having worked on uh, Makua, this also um, a Mozambican version of Makua, as you said, Aaron, I also recognize a bit of that. <laughs> um, I would, you know, uh, I think sort of for Makua, I remember it having lots of discourse functionality. Um, but I wouldn't really, I don't think I'm in a place to say uh, anything much more exact. So we'll see. Hopefully, Julius can reconnect and maybe has more to say about that. Thank you. It's very, very, very interesting. And I can just uh, quickly add to, to Helen's um, question as well with the uh, sort of softening with Ag. I definitely have heard it in uh, Dar es Salaam being used in this way, uh, but with speakers, mostly, I think, Kinga and Hehe. So from the South. So it, adds to the picture, although anecdotal, but still. Yeah, thank you. I think we definitely get this like perception elsewhere. And even in Iringa, when I then ask about the specific use of the subjunctive rather than others, um, people would instantly say, oh yeah, yeah, this is hey, hey, speakers do this. But I don't know that that's so much about like hey, hey, but more the that's the, perceived as or also one of the biggest languages in Yoringa. So to me, that was a way of people saying, this is a very local expression. This is sort of, yes, I, I, I identify this as specifically from here. And it always made people laugh <laughs> as well when I said it in a way, which I think it's also an interesting way which you can tell people perceive it as local and wouldn't really expect you to say to Um Yeah. I have just a question, which is more of a curiosity. Have you found any features which are clearly marked as being prestigious or correct? So if they want to come across as more correct in schools, maybe, or formal settings, um, would, for example, maybe the who, which is maybe perceived as more the correct habitual, be used uh, more than uh, that person would, for example, produce it in spontaneous speech in an informal setting? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think they're quite like with the habitual and the who and ag, uh, we definitely, we have sort of this ongoing discussion about like our methodology and how we can even fund this variation because um, in a way sort of one of our like challenges is that 
uh, we are starting from a point where there's so much uh, like variation, but so little sort of groundwork done. And quite often, elicitation is a bit tricky when it comes to like non-standard variation because um, you know you might ask this would happen I think to many of us in many languages uh, you know about something and people will think of the standard language so like with ag people would often say oh but that's that's not you know correct Swahili or no no we don't use it that's not how you're supposed to speak Swahili so those are like resistance but then just the then you hear that same person using it in the next sentence and that's really common so that's why also the like mixed method and trying to also do lots of just field notes of what we overhear um also because i mean the we have talked about the variation in terms of like geographical variation but of course as we mentioned also at the beginning like domains and registers there's so much more to it and that's so much more difficult to get to in like trying to elicit and of course Yes, we are a big team, but and each of us come with different like languages to it. But that will inevitably, we think, affect what we get back. So it's it's very tricky. But yeah, with the Ag and who we definitely often got like sort of this is not correct Swahili, or we would ask, have you heard, you know, this? Um, even with the like Gunyumba, and people would be like, Oh no, 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 but that's that's you know, you, you should don't write it down, that's not Swahili. And um it, a lot of work and saying, yeah, that's fine, but we're really not after, you know, standard Swahili. So definitely a lot of that. What was interesting, I think, for example, with the habitual, maybe Julius, I don't know if also you want to add something to that, but even, so I interviewed quite a lot of university students, which of course is then a specific group and a specific register and has lots of, uh, you know, uh, I think complications with it. But it, when I would ask about the aga and and the, or the habitual, so quite often people would be like, "Oh, aga, oh, but that's not you know proper Swahili." But I found that lots of university students were actually not sure which the correct correct standard Swahili for habitual mm -hmm. was, and where then the more they were discussing it, were getting really confused, and then would say, "Oh, huwa na pendaga, huwa na penda." No wait, that's not the correct one. So it's interesting that even though there's a resistance to this aga, I found in perception, there also I feel like the who is so is used so 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 little that yeah. also university students who I think have some contact with standard words, so he, are actually not sure that that's the correct standard one. So I thought that was yeah I don't know Julius if yeah yeah it's, yeah it's, it does also you see it's, it's, it's true because you ask people whether do you usually use arg and they say no i don't use arg because arg is not standard but when you interview them in free conversations you hear them mentioning you know um, i mean using arg in their conversations and i think the as you as you said the who is usually used it's like frozen it's very formal you know very few people would use the who in everyday conversations i mean written form yes that's okay now because people are now confused between when we go to ask them the challenge that we are facing is that um, they think that we are interested in the distinction between standard and non-standard so they would say no that is not standard but we are telling them that no we, we you just give us uh, we want the way you speak, I mean, the Swahili you speak, whether it is standard or not standard. That is what we need, the real, the real version of Swahili that you speak. So I agree with you, that, that challenge in getting information regarding AG and other forms. Uh, thank you, very interesting. Um, did we still have part of the question from Aaron, which maybe we had to pass on to Julius? Oh yeah, Julius. I don't know if you had anything more to say about the what the function of the pronoun doubling might be that we have collected in Tuara. Um, uh, okay, sorry, I was offline because um, I I had problems with the internet, but um, I think it is for 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 emphatic purposes to to emphasize. To mean that it is the the same, the very person. If we say who you want to who you, it's the very person that we are talking about. 
uh, maybe there are some other functions that we can find later, but uh, at, for the time being, for the example that we, we encountered, I think it's for emphasis. Thank you. And uh, is it always like uh, one comes before um, the noun and the other one comes after, or would you have something like you like a reduplication? Uh, have you seen anything like this? Yeah, um, to who, who is, is also is also possible, but that 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 um, it, it, well, of course it is common and it's not unique to 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 our, it's, it's even in other varieties of Swahili. Uh, yeah, it's also possible. Um, to who who you um, to yule yule, yeah, um, to who you um, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's common to hear such kind. Of, I mean, it's the very the very person, the same person that maybe we talked about earlier. Well, there are also, also some features of definiteness, I think. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think so. Thank you. Sorry, uh, just one quick question. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that you had a very impressive amount of uh, features that you looked at. I think you said somewhere in the 70s. Um, and just out of curiosity, um, um, or for inspiration, uh, would you be willing to share these features somehow? Or, uh... Yeah, definitely. Yes, we are very ambitious. That's, I think, one thing you can say about the project. We, we start off with very ambitious questions and very ambitious list but yeah definitely in fact that is exactly like uh, one something that we wanted to do is sort of compile a document that then um can be you know used also because it's helpful for us maybe because it's yeah it's a, a lot of features and we cannot possibly uh, the 10 of us cover all of these features in all in all the locations so we use it as a sort of guidance to sort of have it, basically, it's like a list for us to keep in mind, okay, we know that there is variation in this either in Swahili or in Bantu languages, so it's an area to sort of pay attention to. This is how we use it. Uh, but yeah, yeah, definitely, I think uh, we would be very happy um, to share the version that we have now. I think we have stopped adding features now because otherwise we would never have uh, sort of ended adding them. Um, but uh, yeah, we would be very happy, definitely very happy to share and very happy to hear also if people have noticed variation in regards to this feature in some other areas uh, that we might not have gone to or we might have not noticed. So um, yeah, I think, I don't think actually I've put on the slide, but uh, we have a website for our project, which maybe I can put in the chat. Uh, and then also, I think my email is also on the, um, on the website. But it's Swahili dialects .com, uh, Feel free to contact us, and ultimately, we would like to put as much of um, our surveys and questionnaires and material to make it available uh, to people. And on the website, it's sort of still much work in progress. But yeah. All right. Uh, I think we are really done with the question section for today. Scanning the faces. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks everyone for participating today. Um, so looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 21st of February and will be presented by Andrew Harvey. Uh, the title will be announced in the newsletter. Um, so Teresa, Julius, thank you again for this really interesting presentation and everyone else for participating today. And I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.